today's topic is about uh, evaluating players and evaluating teams in esports. So the reason I want to talk about this is because um, the whole point of writing about esports, I suppose, is you're trying to explain your point of view about what you think a player's legacy is or what you think a team's legacy is, what you think their wins and losses mean, what their achievements are. So I feel like the very basis of all of that is trying to figure out how good they are in relation to their entire to their current field and how good they are in relation to all time generally speaking and i wanted to talk about this because there's been a general trend of uh people trying to trying to reduce it to just one tournament or it could be the most prestigious or it could have the most prize money whatever so some examples of this is worlds and league of legends or TI in Dota 2 or this happened in BlizzCon in 2015 where SOS won that title and a lot of people were telling me he was like the best player of that year even though it made no sense I'll explain why a, a little bit later so generally when I when I do it um, when I did it actually I did it for uh, the greatest players of all time in StarCraft 2 what I did was I took a bunch of different factors that I thought were relevant to being to what would make a great player so for instance since it was a 1v1 game i'll go, go on to team game team games later because i feel like analyzing sing, uh, single players and team games is much more complicated just because there's uh, way more factors going on in the in those but for a 1v1 game generally speaking you want to take in the results so that's you win you get second or you get top four that's generally where i cut it off for that particular list because there were so many tournaments i felt that which should have been enough to determine who was the best among them but at times i did go look into the uh, around the eight results as well depending on how close like uh two players were in my ranking the second oh this is this also isn't ranked in like order of importance just rank ranked in like uh, it's not even ranked it's just the number of factors there are so the second factor was uh peak domination which is how strong you were during your entire like entire uh era so for instance if we're talking about like peak domination i felt life probably achieved peak domination in in the entirety of starcraft 2 history in the early in the end from the end of 2014 to early 2015 he was i felt he felt he i felt he had achieved the highest level of play ever seen in that game and uh the only time he ever lost was basically to dream who uh, who was playing out of out of his goddamn mind basically in order to uh, get those wins off of life and then you you have the time uh, how long your peak consistency lasts so for instance life in that period i'd say it lasted about six months whereas somebody like um sue i'd say his his peak probably lasted he, he, had, he probably had like the highest peak that lasted around like not he had like a his like peak consistency overall for how good he was lasted over a year so that's like something to take into account or you want to talk about consistency i feel that's a very important factor as well which is basically how good you did day in day out for a long period of time so in terms of like highest level consistency over a broad period of time i felt mario was the best uh, among all of the players because uh the, for a long period of time just kept getting around the four around the four around the four and that and yeah he wasn't winning as much as compared to his like contemporaries or the all-time greats, but his like level of consistency in play was extraordinarily high. And then to like a lower extent, it would be like something like Parting, who kept going around at sixteens, but but which I found less impressive. And then the final factor is uh the people you beat along the way, and I know some people don't really like this because generally, like they feel like the objective way is to basically like oh t is to basically name a tournament, and then uh, rank them by tiers. So like. GSL will be a tier one, or and then Foreignerlands a tier two or whatever. Generally, how I did it was, I decided. I decided uh, how how who you beat was important as well, and it makes it more subjective because basically I'm saying this player was worse than this player even relative to their times, and I'm fine with doing that because I want to give a subjective view of what I think rather than what than what I think the overall people might think. So I. So, but it requires a lot more reasoning and a lot more research. So I don't really expect people to do this one. But basically, that's what I did when I was doing this list for uh, the greatest of all time in StarCraft Two. So I'll give you a brief example. There were 
there were t- there are two tournaments I'm thinking of. The first one is when Ness T won his G- his third GSL, and it was an undefeat. It was a it was an undefeated streak where he basically went. He basically won every single game. He didn't drop a single game in the entire tournament. And while that sounds impressive, the fact was like even even relative to that time, it wasn't it it wasn't like he he wasn't playing against the elite level of players for almost the entirety of the run. And like they they were just like good or promising or or like uh, maybe one of them got an upset or something. But they weren't like they were. Put it this way, they aren't players that you would remember of now, even if you were like a s- hardcore-ish like StarCraft II fan, right? And then I'll give you another example. Innovation lost his first GSL Finals against Sulky in the first uh, season of Heart of the Swarm in StarCraft II. But let me give you a rundown of who he had to beat in order to get this get to these finals. He had to beat Hyun. He had to, he had to beat Hyun, who was... I think uh, top five Zerg at the time. He had to be Rain, probably top two, top three Protoss at the time. Then he had to be Flash. Arguably, people were pinning him as a better Terran than Innovation at the time. Uh, I thought he was worse, but he was like easily second best in my opinion. And then he had to be Life, who I thought was the best or second best Zerg. Then he had to be Sim- Roro, who had won the last GSL, was a top another top five Zerg. Then he had to be Symbol, who was another top five Zerg. All total, he beat the best players from 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7 in order to get to that GSL Finals. Unfortunately for him, he ran into number 2. And even though he went like 3-0 uh, in the initial like best of 7, he uh, choked like crazy. Like he basically was losing to a bunch of builds he had seen, bef- he had seen before, he had practiced against. Like Symbol had used similar types of builds, similar types of strategies. But this time he, like, he completely like failed the execution. And then in the final game, it was like a super choke where he uh, did that med- medevac boost. Med- medevac boost from his uh, buildings to the edge of his base. And then it ran out and then it ran to like a bunch of mutas so he couldn't even like run it away. At the same time, his other half of the army was killing rocks in the center. And then Sulky's army killed that too. So it was, it was one of the biggest chokes he'd ever seen. And it's kind of funny, I guess, that people will mis- not mis- try to forget about it. But that's like, uh, that's such a fucking crazy choke. It's... It's one of the greatest chokes of all time as well, even though, like, innovation... Even though it's also, like, one of the greatest runs, it's also, like, one of the greatest chokes. So it's a, it's a pretty good run, all things considered. In term, All things considered. So those are all things I think about. And then there are a bunch of external factors as well. For instance, uh, what I think... How, how I think... A, how, much, how much prestige I would attach to a tournament. Or how important I think a tournament was. So, for instance, like, a lot of people generally assume, like, a GSL was always more important. Whereas I felt like, um, I, or I felt like BlizzCon had a bit more prestige. And a top foreigner land, though, could also be very close to GSL. So, for instance, like, uh, the early ML, uh, the 2012 MLGs, IPL, uh, certain dream hack, dream hacks, had, like, crazy lists of players at times. So... That's also why I did the uh, who you beat list because in those cases, uh, people who you beat are, might be more important than the tournament you won at. And I explained a few reasons why. And so we're, we'll come back to the SOS argument for BlizzCon. So a lot of people pinned SOS as the best player of 2015 at BlizzCon because he won it. But if you include all the different factors I had, so I felt like there were at least five players who were who who should have been ranked above him, above above him. Even when you consider like the BlizzCon of victory, innovation, Maru, hero, uh, CJ, Entis hero. I mean, uh, classic, Buell, Dream. Like all these guys had arguments, or all these guys definitively had better achievements and and better better victories against more opponents and across more tournaments across a long, pure, longer period of time. Oh, and Life as well, because I, p- I picked Life as the best player that year, I believe. And so basically, he doesn't even make top five, no, much less first. But because BlizzCon was such a big event, uh, people just like naturally got into the hype and just assumed he was the best, but he wasn't. This incidentally also happened in 2013, but, uh, no, but at the time, the only people that were trying to crown SOS as the best player of all time, uh, best player of the year was Blizzard. 
And I, I thought that was always uh, pretty funny because famously Blizzard put SOS on the second stream. So anybody at BlizzCon could not watch him. All right. So how does this relate to uh, team games like CSGO or Dota 2? Basically, uh, I use very similar factors in order to decide how good a player, how good a team is overall in relation to the entire field. But there are a bunch of external factors that you have to consider here that change the entire makeup of of the game. So for instance, in Dota 2, uh, you'd have to consider all the patches, basically. And you'd have to consider, and it's hard to consider uh, like how, how, a player, how a player is doing well. To, like you have to figure out how much a player is being enabled by the patch, I guess, is a good way to put it. So for instance, Shiki was a terrible player, but he made TI finals, right? But he he kind of, he only had one good hero in the entire pool was Lina. So really, even though even though Shiki had like that one of the highest achievements a Dota two player could ever have, he will go down as one of the worst mid laner, one of the wor- one of the worst mid laners, probably in the professional scene uh, ever, maybe. Like, he'd have to go really down there to find a worse mid laner than Chiki was at that time. It just happened that Q was able to, like, secretly hide this terrible weakness and somehow made it to the finals until, like, PPD called him out on it. In CSGO, there's, like, it's, it's not quite as drastic when you consider, like, the patches, but for both CSGO and Dota 2, you have to consider, you have to consider how good a team is in relation to the player. And what I mean by that is sometimes because... Because there are basically nine extra factors you have to consider when, you, when you're when trying to evaluate a single player's performance in relation to the entire field. So, for instance, I thought Nico was one of the... But yeah, I think Nico was the best player of the year last year. And maybe not the entire year, but I felt like he easily had the... He easily had, like, the... He, he had the uh, achievements relative to his team and and the entire field to prove that he was basically the best player for like uh, vi- uh, the middle part of 2016. And the reason I said this is because if you watch those games, basically he was carrying three dead bodies and then Chris J was his only like helpful, su- helpful, like helpful player on his team. Whereas, and then basically it was Chris J, Nico, and then you had Dennis, Speedy, and then Nex who like fucking disappeared at land for whatever, for whatever reason. So basically, the two of them were carrying everybody, and it's mostly just Nico a lot of the times. So Nico, but what made Nico fucking crazy was he could play, he played Fnatic during Fnatic's crazy uh crazy like six tournament run, and he almost beat them single handedly on Dust Two. Like I can't think of a single one player performance that ever reached that like peak level of just that one game. It was fucking crazy. Because basically what's happening in that game is he's playing against the best player. He's getting playing against the best team. All four other players on that team are very good. Crims, Dennis, JW, Flusha. On his own team, he has Chris J. And then three guys who are missing most of the time. Or who are, miss, or are missing easy shots. Or like who, who over-aggress. Or basically put Nico in terrible positions. And somehow Nico almost took that in overtime. Like that's... That's fucking crazy. And that's why you can't really use results as much when you're rating a single player in terms of how good that player was because I feel like I feel like sometimes you just you just get you just get unlucky in terms of like opportunities you have as a player as of how good you as a proof as a proving how good you actually are so for instance like here's a good example is like Stewie 2k he could ne- he would never be anywhere if get right decided to join cloud nine he, he he'd probably still be playing Oh, no, not probably. He, he, he'd probably be playing uh, FPL for a longer period of time before somebody decided to bet uh, bet their money on him, because you know there's all that investment going in. So eventually he would have rose up anyway, probably. But he rose up faster, and then he proved that he was better than any player on Cloud Nine. And then after you bring after you bring in automatic, automatic you realize, and then this is a very important point. After bringing in automatic, you kind of realize that, yeah, automatic wasn't really that good before Stewie 2k but what, what but you have to you have to have the caveat or question now like all of a sudden he's good so what does this mean in terms of in terms of like player like evaluation does this mean he was in the wrong role does this mean he, he had the wrong team 
like what what exact what exactly was going on here and those are those are so many like different and hard questions to ask which makes player evaluation even harder so these are all so these are all like uh things that make it very hard and generally speak generally speaking because of this i try to disfavor i guess players or like basically i give them like a, some kind of some kind of base element like handicap in my mind where like yeah you, you you were really good on your team but your team was fucking amazing so for instance I'd say I'd say like yeah I think device is really fucking good but I think his team is fucking amazing too so uh, so it's hard for me to say for instance like he is the best player right now he, he was like the best player for sure prior to prior to like a uh, phase defeating them like I felt like there were argument there are arguments before then of cold Zera or snacks being better than him what but whether or not that was true was hard to say because there wasn't enough data at that point whereas like Here's a but here's a crazy element is like if every once in a while you can get like a team where they do have two of the top five best players and I think this is what's happening right now in SK where I think Cold Zara is the best player and I think Fur is like a superstar level player so at this point that team is that team is literally stacked to the gills with talent and skill it's because like Fallen's coming back and Phelps is Phelps has still been pretty good the entire way like. It's, it's really that that team is so fuck goddamn dangerous. But that's like a, that's a different topic. But basically, that's how I've been thinking about uh, evaluating players, evaluating teams, and this is generally why I um, feel like the reductionist argument of trying to put it down to like one tournament or trying to evaluate a player based off of one tournament is faulty. And then if you do this like overarching uh, view of, tr- of players, you get a better sense of when they're overperforming or when they're underperforming relative to um, the general skill level. So for instance, at ESL Pro League th- this week, I felt RP- RBK was grossly overperforming. Like he was basically killing everybody everywhere he met. And that's why Envious, that's why Envious made it out of the group stage. It wasn't because of Scream. It wasn't because of Happy. It wasn't because of XMS. Like, they did okay, or did some of them did better than usual? I felt like Happy was like a bit, ha, I felt like Happy changed his play style maybe a little bit, but it felt like Sixer Sixer was a bit better. But I felt like RPK was the clear carry of that team for that tournament because he was the best player on that team for that tournament. But because of the overarching view I have of I've I've seen from him from overall lands, I feel like this is obvi- an obvious overperformance. Now, if he continues to do this, then I'd have to change my opinion about how good he is overall as a player. But for now, that's what I do. No, for now, I put it up to like an over an over performance for now. It, so, but, oh, one last thing, I guess I'll put it in this into context is you also have to split CS:GO player skill and Dota 2 player skill in a, in two similar contexts. In this, basically, there is a pre battle and during battle like simulation or circumstances or scenarios you could. Where basically the pre battle is bit is um how good a player is at positioning himself to get the best battles possible. Uh, given the relative information they have on the map and information they have from the team, so I feel like Cold Zero is the best at this, and this is why he's so good at mid game and late game in the in the in each round. Or this is why I, this is uh this is a part of like why Anthic Anna is excellent on OG OG even though. People criticize his mid, his mid, his um, early game laning stage so much, is because he's pretty excellent at the entire positioning thing, relative to his team and relative to what he knows on the map, right? And then there's also in game, there's also the uh, b- during the battle. So for instance, I felt like Simple did, n- didn't necessarily have like the greatest sense of one to <laughs> of one to pull back, but he c- continually got away with it because his like his pure mechanics basically let him outshoot everybody out of like a terrible position or like shocks um that famous shocks clip where it, he basically he's on the a side of cash and he got surrounded by like four selfless players i mean hit shot all four of them and i was like wow I, you were in terrible position but kudos you literally killed everybody <laughs> like that's kind of that's, that's kind of how you split it and that's why i've also i also consider cold zero the best player right now is because he has both elements and when you have both elements it makes it hard to even get to the scenario where like you catch him out, you catch him out, 
And even when you get to the scenario, Cold Zero can still have a pretty good chance to win that anyway. Alright, so that's that's it.